All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Uh, today's presenter is Dr. Lena Kalenga, uh, third year pediatric resident. Her advisor for today's uh, presentation is Dr. Hugh Kraft. Dr. Kalenga is a graduate of the University of Cape Town, Faculty of Health Sciences in South Africa. She worked in community health services and pediatrics in Johannesburg uh, prior to relocating to this side of the Atlantic. <clears throat> During her time here, she's worked in streamlining the discharge process from inpatient wards as part of her QI initiative and will be pursuing a fellowship in neonatology at the University of Virginia on graduation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lena Kalinga. Thank you, Dr. Palmashaw, and thank you everyone for joining us for the grand rounds this morning entitled Tiny People, Big Problems, Caring for the Growth Restricted Infant. I have no disclosures. The objectives for today's talk will be reviewing the definitions of um, small for gestational age as well as intrauterine growth restriction. We'll be talking about some of the common causes um, for intrauterine growth restriction. We'll also discuss some of the complications both uh, postnatally and um, the long term implications of IUGR infants. And we will um, sort of highlight some clinical pearls for primary care physicians who are taking care of growth restricted infants in uh, primary uh, care practice. Um, these three figures will sort of feature intermittently throughout my talk. Um, we have here on the, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. So on the far left, we have Etienne Stéphane Tarnier, um, who was primarily a French obstetrician he, along with his mentee, um, Mr. Um, P uh, Pierre Constant Budin, um, they worked closely to improve perinatal mortality. Um, Mr. Tanier, as an obstetrician, played a big part in reducing purpural sepsis. Um, mechanisms called anti-sepsis worked a lot in um, promoting sort of sort of sterilization and sterile procedures. Um, he worked closely with Mr. Tanya, as um, mentioned. Mr. Tanya worked primarily with premature infants. He referred to them as weaklings, but really um, identified pretty early on that they had, um, if the right interventions, sort of paying uh, attention to the nutrition, to the growth, if the right interventions were implemented early on, that their chances of survival were improved. And here on the far right, we have Dr. Lula Lutenko, who was of Russian origin, uh, but her family relocated to the United States pretty early on in life. Um, so she was an American a neonatologist and essentially one of the pioneers uh, for women in neonatology. And her uh, special area of interest was infants who had been small for gestational age. All right, so. We talk about the terms small for gestational age and uh, intrauterine growth restriction, and a lot of the times in clinical practice, the terms are sort of used interchangeably because they're both defined as an infant who's born with a fetal weight uh, or a birth weight that uh, falls below the 10th percentile. However, strictly speaking, um, they're, they're not synonymous and they should not be used inter interchangeably because they mean different things. So, with regards to small for gestational infants, this refers to an infant who is constitutionally small and has achieved its maximal growth potential. Um, at baseline, these infants had no increased risk for adverse outcomes, aside from perhaps issues with thermoregulation and uh, glycemic control. Um, this is an otherwise normally nourished and healthy fetus. Some other characteristics that might clue the clinician into the fact that this infant is just small for gestational age as opposed to um, growth restricted is that they are modestly small. So typically their birth weight falls below the 5th to 10th percentiles. Um, throughout pregnancy, they're able to achieve a normal growth velocity. Um, any obstetrical investigations will demonstrate normal physiology. So they'll have a normal amniotic fluid vo volume and their umbilical umbilical artery dopplers are typically normal. And their abdominal circumference usually falls above the 10th percentile. 
And when taken into the greater context of ethnicity, maternal characteristics, they are appropriate and proportional. This is in contrast to infants who are growth restricted. This is an infant who um, has not achieved its growth potential because of either genetic or environmental factors. This is essentially a malnourished fetus. Um, and here typically the abdominal circumference falls below the 10th percentile for gestational age. Um, it's divided into symmetric and asymmetric fetal growth restriction. If you remember back to medical school days, symmetric growth restriction refers to um, an infant who is proportionally small in that all organ systems are affected equally. Um, and this is typically due to a pathologic process or an insult that has occurred early on in pregnancy, as would be expected in a congenital infection or a gen genetic anomaly. Asymmetric growth restriction, however, you have relative sparing of the of the head, so brain growth is um, is preserved, um, sort of at the expense of other organ systems. Um, so abdominal size, as we said, is significantly affected. Um, you have a smaller liver volume, less subcutaneous tissue and fat. And here the pathologic process or the insult occurs later on in pregnancy. And this is typically seen in issues uh, affecting the placenta like placental in insufficiency. Here's an image of an infant that is growth restricted. Um, this picture really highlights sort of the loose skin prominent around the axilla, the inguinal, uh, the inguinal folds. Um, you can see there's essentially no gluteal fat. You can see the prominence of this, the spinous processes over here. So on physical exam, um, according to the textbooks and clinically uh, from experience, they refer to having sort of a wizened appearance or um, a shrunken face because they have no, no subcutaneous fat. Their cheeks are sort of sunken in. And because um, for asymmetric um, growth restriction, Particularly, you've had relative sparing of the head compared to the rest of the organ systems. The head appears to be larger, even though it may be appropriate in size. Um, they have longer fingernails. The skin is sort of loose and dry and peels pretty easily. The abdomen is flat or scaphoid. Um, they have no skeletal muscle mass so that their arms and legs appear long and thin. Um, the umbilical cord has been described as being uh, thin as well, and they have poor breast bud formation. So why does this matter? Why does it matter that we, you know, that we need to differentiate between SGA versus infrared reader and growth restriction? So for one, as I mentioned earlier, SGA infants typically are not at a higher uh, increase or at higher risk of adverse outcomes. FGR fetuses, however, are at an increased risk of um, adverse perinatal outcomes. Those who are both preterm and growth restricted are at even a higher risk, and there are long-term implications that have been described for infants who were nutritionally deprived in utero. So some of the causes of fetal growth restriction um, divided into a sort of fetal causes, maternal causes, placental causes, and miscellaneous. Some of the fetal causes, genetic anomalies, congenital infections, um, multiple gestation. Some of the maternal causes, also just be aware, this list is by no means all inclusive. It's, it's pretty long. Uh, Preeclampsia is one of the more commonly known ones, chronic hypertension, chronic kidney disease. A mom who's had a pregnancy prior that was affected by fetal growth restriction is at higher risk in subsequent pregnancies. And the risk gets higher with each pregnancy that um, is affected by fetal growth restriction. Sickle cell disease, substance use, so cocaine, chronic alcohol use, um, smoking, heavy first trimester bleeding, uh, placental causes, placental insufficiency essentially accounts for about 80% uh, of the cases of fetal growth restriction. Um, and under miscellaneous, some of the assisted reproductive technologies have been associated with um, intrauterine growth restriction, as well as a short interpregnancy interval, so uh, less than six months, or a long interpregnancy interval longer than 10 years. So, what are some uh, complications that the clinician needs to be 
aware about. Um, they're at a high risk of intrauterine fetal demise, um, perinatal mortality, preterm delivery, perinatal asphyxia, and essentially the first four are related, or essentially all the cases, are related to the fact that they've existed in a chronically hypoxic and nutritionally deprived environment in utero. Um, they have a really difficult time making the transition from in utero to extra uterine life. They have essentially no energy reserves. Um, meconium aspiration, as we know, a lot of the times we see this in post-term infants, but it's also an indication of intrauterine stress. With regard to the persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, as well as the bronchopulmonary dysplasia, this has been hypothesized to be related to the fact that the chronic in utero um, hypoxic environment leads to sort of abnormal pulmonary vascular development. Um, the hypothermia and hypoglycemia are related to decreased subcutaneous fat, decreased glycogen stores, decreased energy reserves. Um, the hypocalcemia is related to the fact that in, because they've existed in a chronically hypoxic environment, there's decreased um, transfer of, of phosphate in utero. Polycythemia and hypoviscosity are related to the fact that the chronic hypoxic environment stimulates the production of erythropoietin. Thrombocytopenia, again, the mechanism is unclear. It has been described in um, a number of growth-restricted infants, referring to a platelet count that is less than 100,000. And this is supposedly due to, they call it placental stunning. So the fact that the placenta has been affected and uh, placental blood supply has been affected leads to thrombocytopenia. And again, because you've had preferential sparing of blood flow to the brain and um, heart, you have um, compromised blood flow to other organ systems, including, including uh, incompromised uh, gut perfusion, and this leads to feeding intolerance or a higher uh, incidence of neck in these infants. All right, so here we have, I'm going to show off a little bit of my French here, Tarnier Martin Couvers. This is essentially an incubator um, that Tarnier had asked Martin to develop for him. Tarnier did not uh, come up with the idea of incubators. Um, there were several physicians, I think the first one was probably in Russia, who had come up with different versions of incubators. And Tarnier had gone to a farm and saw that um, they were keep keeping eggs in the incubators and that they were, you know, coming to hatch from, from the warmth provided by the incubator. So here we have uh, what was designed um, a double walled chamber. I hope you guys can see um, my cursor, the P and the K. The double walled chamber, you have the water here, the W, the water sitting under here. The water would be heated by a flame that's sitting here. The water would be filled from the top here and would drain at the bottom. You have the infant sitting at the top. There would be a glass top covering the infant, and then there would be a warm current of air that would provide ventilation for this incubator. So he implemented this in 18, 1881 at the hospital at which he worked. Uh, by 1883, there was widespread use of this type of incubator throughout France. And they noticed that the mortality related uh, to infant hypothermia had decreased um, from about the the survival rate, sorry, the survival rate for infants had improved from about 35% to 62% with the use of this incubator. Here we have one of the first um, ideas, I would say, for gavage feeding. So Tarnier had come up with the idea or the concept of gavage feeding, and then his mentee, Pierre Constant Boudin, built on this idea. Um, he identified pretty early on that infants who were born prematurely had trouble feeding, and so there was some sort of intervention uh, that had to be implemented. So, and he also identified pretty early on that, um, you know, as infants got bigger, they needed a little bit more, sort of like advancing feeds. So he came up with this little apparatus um, called a graduated apparatus for gavage feeding that would allow um, the nurses or the physicians to increase the feeds as the infant got bigger, and this would be introduced in the nose. In addition, um, Boudin also came up with other ways to improve nutrition for uh, infants who were born prematurely. 
um, or who had difficulty suckling for other reasons. So he invented the nipple shield. He invented a small nipple shield for premature infants. He also invented a breast bump, um, and he did this because he saw that uh, moms who um, were not present for you know, caring for their infants because the infant had to be in the hospital, the mom had to be separated, and then you had to pay the wet nurses to come. Um, and he thought it was important for infants to be provided with mom's own milk. All right, so what are some long term um, complications that we should be aware of? I'm not sure how many of you have heard of the Barker hypothesis. Um, Barker noted essentially that infants who had been born in the 1920s, in the 1920s and 1930s, who had been growth restricted, had a higher incidence of coronary artery disease, diabetes, hyperinsulinemia, and hypercholesterolemia uh, when they became adults. So the Barker hypothesis states that the hostile intrauterine environment, so the chronic hypoxia, the chronic nutritional deprivation, leads the fetus to uh, brain sparing adaptations in order to survive. This leads to decreased production and sensitivity to fetal insulin and insulin growth factor one and upregulation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access. This um, metabolic programming or epigenetic modification essentially, so it doesn't um, make any changes to the DNA, but it does, however, alter the, uh, the gene expression in these infants because it occurs at such a cru crucial time in development. It sort of becomes programmed or permanent. When you take this in combination with other factors, so genetic factors, uh, family history, postnatal environmental factors like a sedentary lifestyle, poor nutritional choices, etc., puts these infants at a high risk of the above mentioned uh, complications. Um, it's sort of um, a controversial subject and it's not necessarily widely accepted. All right, in terms of physical growth, um, typically infants who are only moderately affected, um, so that would be a birth weight falling between the third and 10th percentile, they're able to achieve a pretty rapid catch up growth postnatally so that um, they will weigh. Uh, the same or measure the same in terms of height um, as their peers. However, those who are severely growth restricted, um, so birth weight less than the third percentile, they have a harder time catching up. And so they frequently weigh less and are shorter than their um, AGA counterparts throughout childhood and adolescence. Um, some other long term complications there are neurodevelopmental outcomes that have been described. Again, I think I just need to highlight that for the most part, a lot of these IUGR infants um, sort of who do not have any other comorbid conditions, um, they do fare fairly well. It is simply important to be aware that they are at a higher risk when compared to otherwise SGA or AGA infants. They are at a higher risk of developing CP, a higher risk of having gross motor delays, and these may be subtle. Uh, at a higher risk of uh, having minor neurological impairments. Um, it has been described that they tend to score lower on cognitive testing. They may have some school difficulties and have a greater need for special education. They may be at a high risk of having behavioral problems like ADHD. And the risk is even higher in those who are preterm and growth restricted because we know that prematurity in itself um, has a higher risk for all of the above. All right, so what does the general pediatrician need to be aware of when you're taking care of an infant in your practice who had been growth restricted? One of the biggest things um, is nutrition. And this is interesting because there's no consensus. There's no really strict guideline. We just know that nutrition is key. As pediatricians, we know that uh, there's a crucial time postnatally where brain growth needs to be optimized, and the way to do this is to optimize nutrition. However, as we just talked, these infants are at high risk of developing complications re related to the metabolic syndrome later on in life. So you sort of need to strike that very fine balance between optimal nutrition and avoid overnutrition. 
The goal is to optimize brain growth in order to minimize the adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes. Um, you want to achieve catch up growth and you also want to build up nutrient stores. So there are significant nutritional shifts that occur, particularly in the third trimester. So infants who are born either premature or who are growth restricted and are nutritionally deprived anyway, these uh, nutritional shifts do not occur uh, or are less than ideal. So these kids a lot of the times are being discharged from either the newborn nursery or the NICU. Um, the near the neonatologists have them either on 27 calories, 24 calories, 22 calories, and they leave it up to the discretion of the pediatrician to decide when would be the appropriate time to sort of downscale, upscale, discontinue, etc. So a lot of this will depend on the pediatrician's discretion, but there's a lot of shared decision making between the pediatrician and the family. And this has to be individualized for each patient. So breast is best as always, but it is better when fortified because breast milk does not contain all the, the phosphorus, all the extra protein and calorie, as well as carbohydrates that are important for the catch up growth and for the building up of the stores. Um, how to fortify the breast milk? There is hum this amazing thing called human milk fortifier that is ridiculously expensive. It is like $300 for a box of a liquid, and depending on what calorie fortification, the box may last between a week to two weeks. You can use preterm formula, which is a lot cheaper, and from what I've read, there's really no significant difference between the use of human milk fortifier or preterm formula for fortifying breast milk. Uh, the preterm formula is preferred over just regular term formula because, again, it is designed specifically to provide the extra protein, calcium, and phosphate that is necessary for the catch-up growth. Um, how long to fortify for? This is the million-dollar dollar question from the many different articles that I read. There's no consensus. It's just recommended anywhere between 6 to 12 months because, again, it's about more than just catch-up growth. It's also about building stores. I've heard a couple of neonatologists make the comment that they have the perception that pediatricians are too quick to decrease fortification. Um, again, if breast milk is not available, it's preferred to use preterm formula over term formula. However, again, the, the PCP should use sort of the discretion. Um, important to note that you need to give multivitamins with iron to build up the stores. Again, for any any sort of time period between 6 to 12 months. All right, these kids need to be followed closely um, in order to ensure that they're achieving the optimal growth. Um, so at every visit, we need to measure weight, length, head circumference. That's no different than we would do for um, other infants in primary care anyway. Those who are showing pro-growth should be seen more regularly, and they should be a low threshold to optimize nutrition by increasing fortification if necessary. Um, what is the indication to decrease fortification? Excessive weight gain. What does excessive weight gain mean? There was there are no numbers, no strict numbers. Um, I guess if you see an infant that is crossing centiles at uh, you know the speed of light and is now starting to get to the 90th, 95th, or consistently above the 99th percentile, I guess. Um, if there are any feeding intolerances, for example, that would be also an indication um, to decrease the fortification because uh, sometimes uh, the higher calorie uh, foods are a little uh, tougher on the on the infant gut. Here we have the lulagram, the very first or one of the very first growth charts. Um, Dr. Lula Lepchenko, as I said earlier, uh, had a, a special interest in infants who are small for gestational age. And she highlighted that there was a difference between infants who were premature and infants who were small for the gestational age. Prior to that, essentially any infant who weighed less than 2000 grams was referred to as being premature. Um, so she designed this, this graph that would allow uh, clinicians to plot an infant's weight against its gestational age. Um, and it was referred to as the lulagram. And so the growth charts we're using today are all adaptations of the original. Here I, I've inserted some examples of uh, what we like to see or what we would like to see in terms of catch up um, for weight for age for an infant. This infant was premature at 34 weeks. 
I've used the regular graph. This is not the premature growth chart. This is just the regular term infant growth chart. And the reason I use this is because I wanted to highlight the fact that by right before two months of age, this infant was already able to be plotted on a regular growth chart. Um, so that by six months of age, he was tracking above the 50th percentile on a standard growth chart. So that is pretty impressive catch up growth. Same for length for age here um, on the regular growth chart. By the time this infant was six months was tracking well um, at, uh, uh, above the 75th percentile, I would say, um, when compared to his peers who had not been premature or growth restricted. And then look at the beauty of the increase in size and the head circumference. So there's a window in which we should optimize um, brain growth, and it's important to not miss that window pretty early on in development. Um, in terms of the neurodevelopmental outcomes, um, just do the routine developmental screening at each visit. Pay close attention to uh, any developmental delays, but don't forget to correct for prematurity because we do expect premature infants to be a little behind compared to their peers. Um, refer to early intervention or developmental pediatrics sooner rather than later. All right, so more on Boudin. He described pretty early on the importance of early bonding for mom and baby. Um, when it came to the feeding, I, I touched on it earlier. These sick babies, he said, we want to save them. We absolutely want to save these babies, but, but we want to save them in a way that is safe and in a way that will allow us to send them back to a home and a mom, a mother that is loving. However, when we're separating them, when we're keeping the baby in the hospital and the mom has to be separated from my infant, and in addition, we now have to pay wet nurses to come and supply food for these infants, you will see that the mom sort of loses interest. Her milk dries up. She starts to visit less and less often until eventually when it's time to discharge the infant, the mom doesn't show up to pick up the child. So he said he felt pretty sad at that. Um, hence, he came up with all these different apparatuses, including the, the, the breast pump, to encourage moms to really participate in caring for their infants and providing nutrition for their infants. He also encouraged the idea of putting moms to uh, uh, babies to mom's chest. So his infants were born vigorous, had to be uh, put on mom's chest, and he said that this would be uh, important to sort of encourage uh, uh, more collect down and more production. Um, another thing he identified is that moms who are being discharged home with healthy babies or uh, were going home and coming back days later or weeks later with an infant who was critically ill from being too cold from having not uh, gained weight appropriately or from sepsis. Um, so he established the first baby clinic um, in order for these moms and babies to be followed up um, initially weekly so that the babies could be weighed, um, they could optimize nutrition and intervene as necessary. He would provide education to the moms on how to care for the babies. So uh, proper hygiene, how to keep the babies warm, how to feed them safely. The first baby clinic was established in 1892. Um, sadly, um, he traveled to another town in France uh, with the um, intention of establishing a baby clinic and he contracted the flu and pneumonia and died. Here's some food for thought. Um, and this is a beautiful quote, I think. Everything ought to be done to ensure that an infant be born at term, well developed, and in a healthy condition. But in spite of every care, infants are born prematurely. In addition, there are tiny, puny infants with great vitality. Their movements are untiring and they're crying lusty, for their organs are quite capable of performing their allotted functions. These infants will live, for although their weight is inferior, their sojourn in the womb was longer. In case anyone was wondering what my obsession with the NICU was. And this was by Pierre Constant Boudin. All right, uh, we have, I think, two questions. Here's the first question if people will just type their answers into the chat. Which of the following is a potential long term complication of intrauterine growth restricted infants? Oops, sorry. Well, the answer is C, metabolic syndrome. All right, let's go on to the next question. Um, 
which of the following maternal conditions is most commonly associated with symmetrical intrauterine growth restriction? If people will type their answers into the chat. All right, and the answer is C, chronic alcohol abuse. All right, alcohol abuse is the answer. Here are my references. Um, special thanks to Dr. Kraft who, um, for his guidance uh, while I was preparing this talk and for the very interesting history lessons as well. All right, do we have any questions? Uh, Lena, that was a very nice review, uh, and I always enjoy talks that have a little bit of history in them. Uh, did you come across anything uh, regarding the the incidence of of IUGR? My sense is that it's not as common as it was when when I was in training, but I I don't know if you came across the information that that has shown that in fact the incidence of IUGR infants has changed with time. Um. The incidence in developed countries is a lot lower than it is in um, sort of developing countries. In developing countries, it's been described to be as high as 25 to 30 percent of pregnancies. In developed countries, it's about only 10 percent of pregnancies, from what I've read. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? If anyone's interested in exploring Boudin, in more detail, he he actually wrote what is considered the the first textbook of neonatology. It's called the Nursling, and like most things, you can find a reprinted edition of it on Amazon. Uh, and it, it's it's ten lectures, uh, each each chapter kind of covering a different aspect of his approach to you know how he cared for infants in the nursery. And it, it's really a a fascinating read because he he really is I think considered. Uh, kind of the founder of, of neonatology as a as a science and a specialty, even though uh, it took many years and many other uh, people to kind of nurture along to to the state that we see it in, is is in today. Yeah, what I read on him, um, he worked pretty hard um, to sort of improve perinatal mortality. Um, 45 breast milk to what caloric content or formula? Um, so again, there are no strict numbers. A lot of the times, as I said, that they are being discharged from the hospital or NICU already on a certain caloric concentration. So whatever the, neonatolo the neonatologist felt had um, led the infant to gain some weight, whether it be 22, 24, some need as high as 27. Um, and sort of going forward, when you see these kids outpatient, it's all a matter of growth velocity. Are you seeing the results that you want to see? Um, and it's also about the infant being able to sort of maintain that growth, uh, that, you know, that, that catch up growth. Um, a lot of the times we may run into trouble where, you know, you sort of get the kid on the growth chart and then you decrease the fortification and then you see that the growth starts to slow down or sort of flatten out. Um, so it's important to allow them, you know, a, a couple of data points that have shown continued growth or continued catch up growth, um, and then to decide to, you know, come down on the fortification on the fortification based off of that. And then if you're not seeing the results, so if you're seeing that the growth is really lagging behind, um, you're not seeing the catch up growth or you're, you're flattening out, it's important to sort of have a low threshold to um, increase the fortification based off of that. That there are no strict numbers, and again, each case is going to be individualized to the infant, to how severely growth restricted they were, and it's um, shared decision making between the pediatrician and the family. So there are there are growth charts for preterm infants, and even for growth. That's a good question. Yeah, there are growth charts for preterm infants, growth restricted infants. They actually do have their own special growth charts. And it's important to use that earlier on to sort of see how they fare compared to their their peers who were similarly premature.